When a public official gets a call from somebody on the Spotlight team, they usually know that they're under investigation for doing something that they thought nobody would catch them doing. From the start of virtually every project we do, we know we are sailing into the path of powerful, wealthy, sometimes politically connected people, and we are going to challenge them on their home turf. And we are going to say things about them that if anything is wrong, we will wind up in court or someplace else that's not very pleasant. Forty-five years ago, when I started the Spotlight team, it was a new idea. Pull three or four full-time reporters out of the city room, set them up somewhere else in the building, spending four, five, six months not covering the news the way it would be otherwise. If anybody had told me that it would become the longest-running full-time investigative team in America, you know, I would have said they're maybe a little off the beam. And there were those of us on the team, and there were certain people outside of the globe who didn't think it would last a year. It's an old Boston police expression. When the Boston police want to get rid of you, attaboy, and you, you know you're done with it. Tim Leland, he had been told that three or four reporters won't be able to work together. We're all headstrong, we all know best. Journalists often are lone wolves. We do our own thing, we're by ourselves. And this is a different form of journalism. You're on a team and it's a collaborative effort. When you do this kind of work, you're submerging for a long time and your name may not be in the Boston Globe for many, many months. Investigative reporting is looking in corners, you're shining a flashlight or a spotlight into a corner where nobody is looking. We find people who are victimized by society and by institutions that are supposed to protect them. We give a voice to people who are voiceless. In late July of 2001, we got a new editor, Marty Barron. His very first day on the job, he made a reference to a Sunday column about 84 lawsuits against one priest, John Gagan. This guy's personnel records were under court seal. And Marty asked a pretty simple question. You know, why are these sealed and have we tried to unseal them? The longer you're in the business, the more you have a sense of that might be a really good story. Political corruption we did, shoddy building construction. I mean, we've never done anything on the Catholic Church. The Archdiocese of Boston created these directories of all their priests. It listed what their names were, where they were assigned, and what their status was. We began to realize that when priests had been removed from a parish because of a sex molestation complaint, they would be listed suddenly as being on sick leave. When we eventually went to the church with our list of questions, they not only told us that they wouldn't answer our questions, they told us they didn't want to know what our questions were. But I think that speaks to how deferential people, including the media, had been to the church for so many decades, especially in a very Catholic city like Boston. The church was used to not being questioned and not having to answer questions, and it had no interest in doing it in our case. If somebody really fundamentally despises what you're doing and they're reading every word thinking you are damaging my career or reputation, you can't get anything wrong. You've got to be right from the start to the finish. The story that will be published, it's going to carry a logo. It's going to say spotlight on it. And that means something. It means something to us. It means something to our audience. And it means it's the most deeply reported stories that we can publish. And the things that you read here are true. And we know they're true because we checked every single fact. We did everything we could, including create this database of where priests have been reassigned over the years. We eventually pieced that together and began to realize that it was a much bigger problem than the church had let on. We went back to Marty and said, we can get you this story about Father Gagan, but we have discovered that there's almost 100 priests who've been doing the same thing, and the church has covered it up by making hush payments to victims. I went to visit a fellow who went to same high school I did. He had been abused by a priest, a Jesuit, and I went to visit with him in his office. He's a very successful businessman, and he had not told his wife, and he told me what happened to him. He started to cry, and so did I. On January 6, 2002, we published our first story. I don't think any of us really had a sense of what was going to happen. Like everyone else, 
picked up the Sunday paper, and you know, there's an old expression, only the globe can stop time. You have that across the top of the front page that makes all what you thought about this agency or this person or this event that happened, it changes everything because this was sort of early in the internet era, that meant that not only people in Boston were reading our stories, people all over the country. The telephone system was clogged with callers who said, it's not just Father Gagan, there are others. Pretty soon, the totality of the spotlight reporting and the impact it had at first here in Boston and then the concentric circles leading out nationwide and globally became irrefutable and so powerful that people were looking inward and trying to figure out why this happened. Imagine this happening to you when you're 11 or 12 years old, you're ashamed, it was a priest. This is, you know, this is our pathway to God, right? We were getting these tip calls saying, I made an allegation of abuse against this priest and this year, everything began to match up. Suddenly we had whole stories unfolding in front of us. There's this uh, Hollywood version of what investigative reporting is. That can be glamorous and, you know, running down bad guys. And that really isn't what it is. A lot of it is drudgery and shoe leather reporting. You're in an office and you're going through boxes and boxes of documents. And then marbled in with that, you're developing sources. You're trying to get people to tell you things that they don't want to tell you, or they shouldn't tell you, or they're risking their jobs if they tell you. That takes time and that takes patience. You have to look these people in the eye and make them feel like the public will benefit by the story that will be told. You know, one of the traditions of any reporting team is to confront that person whose name is going to be on the front page with allegations of wrongdoing before it's in the paper. We had an allegation of abuse by Father Paquin. I said, let me see if I can go talk to him. I found him in Arlington and I waited outside his house and I was listening to a talk show. Someone important in the city had called in and said, you know, I think this is just a scandal involving one or two bad apples. This is not pervasive within the church. Now, I knew having worked for two weeks already, three weeks already, this was not one or two bad apples. So as Father Paquin walked down the street and I saw him and he went up his steps and he went in his house and before he closed the door, I came up and I said, Father Paquin, I'm Steve Kirkshin from the Boston Globe and I absolutely need to talk to you. He was about to slam the door, I put my hand, I said, Father Paquin, we have the story, and I need to get your side of it. What involved you with abuse of children? You're a man of the cloth, you nothing something you would do out of sinisterness. And what he told me was that he had been abused as a child by a priest. The demons that it brought in him, he was acting out in abusing children and there's a cycle, a vicious cycle. He said, it's not me, it's not just me, there are others, absolutely, but understand, and this was a terrible quote that he said, but, and I looked at him and I said, I'm gonna use that. He said, it's true. And it was, I never gained pleasure, I gave pleasure. And that was really in the heart of darkness. And I said to him, you know, what you've given me here, I'll make sure it's in the paper, but this whole thing is blown up and everyone is gonna have to suffer the consequences. In at least the first year that we covered this, we probably wrote at least 600 stories. We were trying to cover why did this happen? Why do priests abuse children? Why did there seem to be more boys abused than girls? We were trying to explore every aspect of why this had happened. It became a daily beat, essentially, with competition from other media outlets, which usually doesn't happen to Spotlight. I think that our stories did make it hard for some people to want to continue to be Catholic, but I think there are also many people who feel such a strong bond to the church and to their local parish and their local priest, that they, they will stick with it anyway and, and try to change from within. Catholics have demanded that the church ought to be about the faithful and that the church ought to stand more steadfastly for human rights. And I think the new pope listens. All that's happened, that priests have been dismissed and our cardinal lost his job and thousands of victims were able to come forward and get help, all that's good, but my biggest takeaway is what didn't happen. And what didn't happen is thousands and thousands of children who would have been abused were not because of this coming to public light. And for me, that's 
most of them. We worked very, very hard. We were there pretty much every day, week after week after week. We canceled a lot of vacations. This story owned at least a year and a half of my life. We have the time to do the story right, and that's an enormous luxury and a privilege in this business. But with that commitment comes a certain lifestyle and a way of living that gets very intense. You have to be all in, because it's going to take some time. You're going to get a lot of resistance. You might even get banged around a little bit. There is a lot of online news that is focused on celebrity, photo galleries. There's more pressure to produce quickly. We just need to make sure that we keep the balance so that in addition to the entertainment online media, we still have really in-depth, long-term reporting, patience from editors to leave you out of the paper for a while in hopes that you'll deliver something really powerful. The Globe is one of those papers that does. You know, we not only have a spotlight team, it's bigger than ever. The ability to sniff out corruption, sniff out malfeasance, and report it in a major media institution like the Boston Globe is many times the only way these things come out. It's hard-fought terrain. Every sentence, every paragraph, you have to fight for it. You have to ask those questions of powerful people in powerful places, and there has to be a watchdog. And if not, that's, that's where things go wrong. <laughs>